Good evening, everyone. Good to have you out for our evening service. As we begin, we'll be singing number 208, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Hum along. Will 
Heavenly Father, once again, we want to thank you and praise you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace that you bestow upon us day by day. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege and the opportunity we have to be in your house to hear the word of God preached so that we might grow in our faith. We thank you for Pastor and pray for the power of your spirit upon him as he brings forth the word of life to us this evening, that we would be encouraged and strengthened. We also want to pray for continued healing for Pastor and Mrs. Glennon as they recover from their surgeries. For others who may be ill in the church, Lord, we pray for health and strength and uh, restoration of their health needs. Thank you for each one that has come out this evening, Lord. We pray that uh, you would be here, present with us, as we seek to hear from your word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, announcements once more. Uh, Sunday services at 11 o'clock and 6 o'clock, still at regular times. No Wednesday evening services till further notice. Continue to practice social distancing in the building and outside. outside. You know, it's so much easier to do the announcements when I actually see the list in front of me and follow it. This morning I was ad living and uh, got almost all the points. Uh, we don't pass the offering plate. So if anybody has offering to give, they put it in my pocket and I walk by. No, <laughs> offering plates at the back on the uh, table, and uh, place your offering in there. And for those who are unable to attend or are listening online, uh, the offering envelopes on the outside of the building next to the door, where you can put it in the mail slot. Or also, your offering can be given as need transfer directly in the church account at Emmanuel Baptist. Church Fort Mac at gmail.com. Baptist Bread devotionals are on the back table. Also, the uh, some devotionals in Pastor's mailbox that are there to encourage you. And the Sound the Trumpet for June is also on the back table. If you would like to take that. And that's our announcements for this evening. At this time, we'll do our memory verse. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. And uh, when you found that, please stand with me. And we'll repeat our verse once again four times. Let's begin. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And you may be seated. And we have a special at this time.
date, have an outline of the book. In verse in chapter number one, you have a vision of Christ. In chapter two and three, you have a vision of grace, the church. Chapters four and five, you have a vision of the throne when Jesus, of course, takes the sealed book and begins to open it. Then in chapter 6 through 19, you have a vision of government. Chapter 21 and chapter 22, you have a vision of glory. So just to refresh our minds again, remember the first uh, seven seals, beginning in chapter number 6, is the government of mankind. Man is ruling, man is wanting to rule the earth, and of course, in the conclusion, man ruins the earth. And then in chapter seven, we have a parenthesis, just like we'll see in chapter 10, another parenthesis, God gives a pause, gives a pause for man to consider all the havoc and destruction that's going on, and of course, God always deals in grace before he does judgment. So chapter seven, of course, is the sealing of the 144,000, and then the saving of the saints. Chapter 8, of course, began the beginning of the trumpet judgments, and there was silence in heaven, verse number 1, for about a half an hour. And then as those judgments began to come forth, those four first trumpets, it was destruction to the earth, not mankind, but to the earth, the seas, the oceans, uh, the constellations, and then in the fifth trumpet, of course, we have chapter 9. The fifth trumpet, of course, we have Satan uh, coming down from heaven and uh, opening up the pit and unleashing the creatures or the demons that come out looking like locusts and then all different kind of shapes of lions and faces of men and hairs of women and so forth. And we see that those judgments and that fifth judgment and those demons were not to kill mankind, but only to torment them for five months. And then in verses 13 through 21, we have the sixth trumpet. And of course, we have the four angels that are bound in the Euphrates River. They're loose, and then we'll see what havoc they bring forth. So we're right now, right at the halfway part of the tribulation, uh, the Antichrist has made a pact with Israel. He's now broken that peace treaty, and uh, he is now showing who he is and that he wants worship. Remember, Satan has always wanted worship. And he tried to even have the audacity to try to have the Lord Jesus Christ worship him. And, of course, three rhetorical statements he made about our Lord, if you're the Son of God. And of course, we know he's the Son of God. And Satan knew also that he was the Son of God, but just being condescending to the Lord and thinking that he could get the Lord of glory to actually bow down and worship him. And be mindful, Satan wants worship. And uh, Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. And so Satan, of course, is vying for your attention and your affection even. And so we need to be mindful of that. And uh, daily, as I spoke this morning, we have the three enemies that, of course, are around us. The world entangling us, the flesh enslaving us, and of course, Satan deceiving us. So let's get this last portion now, the voice at the vision, verses 1 through 12, now we have the voice from heaven. This voice, of course, is from the golden altar where the prayers of the saints were praying and asking the Lord in chapter 6, how long, how long, Lord, will you bring vengeance? Remember, this is tribulation, this is not grace. So, of course, God always deals in grace before judgment, but tribulation is about judgment. And the sixth angel sounded, I heard the voice, a voice, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, 
loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for the slave, the third part of men. On chapter 6 and verse 8, we had a one-fourth of mankind slain, and now here, one-third. So by this time, in the middle of the tribulation, half of mankind has been slain. So terrible havoc and destruction and carnage coming to mankind. And the number of the army of the horsemen, these are of course the creatures, the demons that are coming out of the abyss, were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them, that's 200 million demons. And I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of Japheth, and we said Japheth is blue, as a blue flame when you strike a match, and you have orange and red and uh, hues and also blue. And brimstone, more about that momentarily, brimstone. Remember when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, it was brimstone coming out of heaven that destroyed those two cities and mankind that were there in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lion. Remember, remember, this is figurative language. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three were the third part of man killed by the fire by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents. So you had scorpions in the first 12 verses of this chapter. Three times we have these scorpions stinging man. But here we have serpents killing man and had heads, with them they do hurt. Now you would think that all of this carnage, you would think that man would fall on their faces before God and repent and get right and cry out for mercy and for grace and forgiveness, but such is not the case. For, their, for verse 20 says, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not, and here it is, worship devils. And of course, Satan desires worship. And idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk who false idols. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. I want to go into chapter 10 and read these 11 verses quickly for us. And you see, once again, God has a parenthesis. God has a caution. God has a waiting before more judgment comes. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow was upon his head. His face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had on his hand a little book opened, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. When he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. When the seven thunders, thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea, 
and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that are therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer this doesn't mean now the end of the world or the end of the age but this means now God is going to send out his judgment swiftly he's waited and been patient but now no longer when the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to the servants the prophets and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth and I went unto the angel and he said unto me, and I said unto him give me the little book he said unto me take it and eat it up it shall make thy belly bitter why because of destruction and judgment but it should be in thy mouth sweet as honey and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. It was in my mouth sweet as honey. As soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Why? Because of judgment. He said unto me, Thou must prophesy, this is John now, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nation, tongues, and kings. Father, I thank you once again for this moment in time to be together thank you for these who come this evening thank you for the special music and uh, lord we're going to see you someday it's going to be marvelous it's going to be wonderful it's going to be majestic it's going to be magnificent and lord i look forward to that day but lord as you tarry your coming the book of the revelation some people call the bible an outdated book it's more fresher than tomorrow's news. And Lord, the things recorded in this ninth chapter bring us right up to date on July the 12th, 2020. I pray now that you will give us a good hearing. I pray that the Holy Spirit would illuminate his word to us. And I pray that we might be challenged and encouraged and enlightened see the time that we're living in and Lord what our part and responsibility is because we know the Lord those of us who do we have a great responsibility to be on the lookout for souls of men and women and boys and girls and that's my prayer this evening in Jesus name amen so we see then these angels are being loosed. Uh, they have been bound so they would be fallen angels. They have been bound in the Euphrates River for these aeons. How much time, how long, we have no idea, but they have been bound. But the Bible has a lot to say about the Euphrates River. In Genesis chapter one, when it talks about how the garden was watered, there are four rivers. One of them was the Euphrates River. And so we think of the beginning of mankind. I don't know, am I supposed to say the word mankind? Or someone says we're not mankind, but the Bible says we're mankind. So the beginning, the fertile crescent, was the Euphrates. At the Euphrates was the first murder. At the Euphrates was the first burial of a brother, of a son. At the Euphrates, we had the first rebellion with Nimrod in chapter number 11. And then here, in the finality of the final book of the Bible, once again, we'll have mentioning of the river Euphrates in chapter number 16. So as we look then and see the loosing of these angels that are bound, we're mindful of the fact that God has a timetable and that timetable is always right on time. Look at verse number 15 again. So they were prepared 
You know, God never leaves anything undone. He's always prepared. Uh, I like Mrs. Glennon. She's always prepared. Uh, she even has a list when we we go to, usually when we go out of town, it isn't for holidays, it's usually visiting doctors or what have you. And she has a specific list of what she's taking. And as far as I am, the day that we're leaving, I start. <laughs> and uh, usually, usually, uh, kind of have a little way that I pack things, but she is very specific and very organized, and I appreciate that. And uh, I appreciate what she does uh, for the church as a secretary, and then what she does in organizing meals in her home. What are we having for supper? And uh, usually is the question of the day. And so uh, she'll get, when she gets home tonight, uh, she'll be, begin preparing for what's gonna be for supper tomorrow. And so she's organized. Well, God is organized. And he's not the author of confusion. Uh, he's not double-minded. Bible has a lot to say about a double-minded man. A double-minded man or a double-minded woman is unstable in all their ways. So God is specific. He's on time. And even to the hour, to the day, to the month, to the year, preparing to take care of man. And of course, this army is 200 million strong and uh, we see that they're horsemen these horses in the vision very unusual but uh, they have breastplates of fire and uh, of jessup of course and that's the color blue and then brimstone and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions out of their mouth issued fire smoke and brimstone so we see the devil's army and uh, we see the killing by these three uh, elements, by the smoke and the fire and the brimstone. I want you to find Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19, and I'll, I'll be brief, but uh, Genesis 18 and 19. Genesis 18 is a spiritual Christian. Genesis 19 is the carnal Christian. If you remember in the Old Testament, uh, we had what's called uh, Christophany or a theophany. That is an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in chapter 18, we have the Lord Jesus and two angels coming to Abraham. And of course, uh, they're going to be fed by Abraham. And Sarah is going to giggle because the Lord Jesus is going to say that baby is coming. Even though it's been 25 years, my promises are true and steadfast. And what I say will come to pass will come to pass even though you've been waiting 25 years, and she giggled. And of course, they named the child Isaac, which means laughter. So now we leave spiritual Abraham, and we come to carnal Lot. Remember, there came a time in the life of Abraham and Lot when they divided. Remember, Abraham, and we think of the Bible, the New Testament, we're thankful that the New Testament covers some things in the Old Testament. And we're thankful for grace. We're thankful that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're thankful that God forgets, forgets our sins. When we become saved, he buries our sins in the deepest sea, puts a sign, no fishing, and removes our sins as far as the east is from the west, so far hath removed our transgressions from us. So we have a God an infinite God, a loving God who forgives and uh, who loves us and covers our sins. And so, of course, we realize that Abraham wasn't a friend of God and father of the faithful all the time because he failed in a moment of famine. And when he should have trusted the Lord, uh, he went to Egypt. When he went to Egypt, and Egypt is always a picture of the world. And uh, when he went to Egypt, he spent 10 years there, spent too long there, uh, brought an Egyptian maid for Sarai, his wife, and of course we know the story that uh, because Sarah did not believe God, uh, she uh, decided that she would uh, have Hagar, her slave girl, marry her husband so they could have a child, not believing that God was going to provide the heir that he promised. And of course, all the havoc in the Middle East, all the famines, the wars, uh, the destitute of that Middle East uh, country and nations, 
Now, they're fighting one another, always have been. Why? Because Ishmael, and God said he would be a warrior, and of course, no peace in the Middle East until Jesus comes. And I'd like to read this whole chapter, but I don't have time. But in this chapter, of course, verse 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at Eve, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and bowed himself with his face to the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, unto your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise early, and go on your way. And they said, No way. Not interested in coming into your home. Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. You know, the most miserable person in the world is a backslidden Christian. The most miserable person in the world is a Christian who's not right with God. And that's exactly what happened to Lot. In fact, if we didn't have 2 Peter chapter 2 in the Bible, you would never believe that Lot was a Christian because of what we're going to read here. And so they didn't want to fellowship with Lot. And uh, they did, of course, fellowship with Abraham and Sarah. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned unto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast. And did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, now here it is, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, can pass the house round about old and young. All the people from every quarter. They called him a lot and said to him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now, I'm not going to be graphic, obviously, but how horrible this is. Lot went out the door unto them and shut the door after him. Now listen to Lot. And said, I pray you, what did he call them? Brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known men. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes. I want to slap him about here. Only unto thy, these men do nothing. But therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. They came to the wrong place. And they said, Stand back, who are the angels? And they said again, This one, this fellow came to sojourn. Sorry, not the angels. These are the men of Sodom. And he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee. You never compromise as a Christian. You never compromise with the world because the world will eat you up and spit you out. There must be a separation. That's why Paul said, be a separate, saith the Lord, and come out from the unclean thing, and I will be a father unto you, and you should be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. No fellowship, no fellowship. Would have, would have fellowship with light, with darkness? There is no fellowship, and there should not be fellowship with the world, but we compromise. We compromise in our stand. We compromise in our standards. We compromise by our state, and before you know it, we're acquiescing to the world. And I mentioned this morning, that's why people come to church and don't really want to listen to the message, because six days in the week, uh, they've been listening to the world, the flesh, and the devil. So when they come in the church house and hear the sermon, and hear the message from God, and God wants to get a hold of their heart, they're not interested, and they're far away. Why? Because they've allowed the world, the flesh, and the devil to take them away from the things of the Lord, and how that breaks the heart of the Lord. And notice, <clears throat> verse number eight. Behold, now I have two daughters. I already read that. And uh, bring them out, and I'll bring them out to you. Do them as good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore they are come on the shadow of my roof. And they said, stand back, for they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he had needs be a judge. Now we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the men, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men, the two angels, put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house and, and to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness both small and great, so that they worried themselves to find the door. How wicked, how ungodly. In Romans 1, I read last week, verses 18 following, and the Bible says that God gave them up to reprobate mind. God gave them up. 
God gave them up three times, we read, just like these three wolves in the book of Revelation. God gave them up. Why? Because they were reprobates and because they turned their back on decency and deity and wanted to live for the world, the flesh, and the devil. And of course, they get their reward. So, they spoke them with blindness and they worried themselves to find the door. And the men said in the lot, Haste, hast thou here any besides son and law and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. Now please watch this. We will destroy this place because the cry of them is wax great before the face of the Lord. Nothing goes unseen by the Lord. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro from the earth. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spake to his son-in-laws. Now look at this. Which married his daughters and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocketh unto his sons-in-laws. When the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife, thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the inequity of the city. And I won't get into all this, but that's for time. Let's just jump down to verse uh, number 24. Then the Lord reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah what? Brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But watch it. But Lot's wife looked back from behind and she became a pillar of salt. Go back to to our text. How very sad. Fire and brimstone. Why did Lot's wife turn back? What would be the reason for her to turn back? Well, if being a loving mom, she wasn't just looking back at the city. She was realizing that her daughters were there with her son-in-laws. Her son-in-laws. And those girls were going to be consumed. Maybe she begs a lot. I could just assume or presume that assume that she told Lot, Lot, don't do this thing. Lot, stay with Abraham. I think we need to stay with Abraham. Lot, don't split from Abraham. I think we need to stay with Father Abraham and be faithful. But whatever the reason, those girls were destroyed and she became a pillar of salt. And remember the Lord mentioned, remember Lot's wife. So he's saying the world, the flesh, and the devil will suck us up. Now notice, if you will then, the reaction of man. After all this, one third of man killed by the fire and the brimstone and the smoke. And you would think that man would say, you know, it's time to get right with God. Such is not the case. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their works. Just like, just like Pharaoh, turn to Exodus chapter 5. They hardened their hearts. The Bible says, he that being often reproved, hardened his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed. And that about remedy. To harden the neck, that means you refuse to repent. The idea of repent is a turning. Turning from and turning to. Turning away from and turning to. Turning away from sin and self and self-righteousness and turning to the Lord. Now notice what we have then in Exodus chapter 5. Please in verse number 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel Go. Notice, if you will, um, verse uh, chapter number seven and verse 
number three. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply thy signs and thy wonders in the land of Egypt. The verse 13. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. Chapter 8 and verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart, and hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. Look at chapter 9 and verse 34. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. Look at Romans chapter 9. Think about a hardened heart. I can't stress enough. I say it as much as I can when I remember how important to rear and, and see young children come to Christ while they're young. Because people get hardened and get indifferent. Uh, especially when they become teenagers, they begin to see humanity and what it's all about. While their children, mom and dad are their heroes, the preacher, the Sunday school teachers are special, but as they get older, they begin to see the glitches in our armor, and they begin to realize that we're not perfect, and teenagers are looking for perfection, and once they realize that there is no perfection in mankind, they can then go on and mature, because there is no perfect family. The psalmist says that man in his best state is altogether vanity. That's why the Bible says, put not confidence in man, but in the Lord. And listen what Paul had to say in the matter of Pharaoh and the hardened heart. Romans chapter 9 and verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, has I, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he harden. By the way, God didn't harden Pharaoh's heart. God just solidified what Pharaoh did in his heart. When man go into sin, and when men go into sin, and even Christians go into sin, God will just take his hands off. If you want to live in sin, help yourself. But there'll come a time when that imaginary line you'll cross, and God will take you to heaven prematurely, because you're not going to repent and get right with God. And so how hardened man's heart can become, how deceitful man's heart is, Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things who can know it. Well, the Lord knows the heart, so we must have a tender heart. We must have a pure heart. Wherewithal, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. And so Paul is writing, reading on and uh, writing on. Thou wilt say unto me, why, verse 19, why does he yet find fault, who hath resisted his will? But nay, nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest, pliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me not thus? Hath not God power, hath not the powder, power over the clay to make, of the same lump, to make one vessel unto honor? another unto dishonor. And you read that in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, that God wants a vessel. He wants a clean vessel. He wants a vessel for honor to be used to the Lord. And our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We're to give our bodies over the Lord and let him be controlled of these bodies and not the world, the flesh, and the devil. What if God, willing to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for fitted to destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had for, notice, which he had afore prepared on the glory. So every day in the world, beloved, you have a choice, and I have a choice to be for the Lord. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Remember, Satan asked the Lord to worship him in Matthew 4, verse 9 and 10. So we have the heart of man's heart, then we have, of course, the devil worship. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 brings us right to where we are today. Now the Spirit, now this is written 2,000 years ago. Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly 
that in the latter times, some, not all, some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Think about these demons. Remember, these demons that came out of the pit, they can, they can oppress you, but they cannot possess you unless you're lost. If you're lost, demons live in bodies of lost people. Remember when the, the maniac of Gadara in Mark chapter 5. Remember those demons. There were so many demons in them. They said our name is Legion. There's so many. And those demons wanted to go up from that man to the pigs. And so demons want to possess. And they do possess people. And they possess lost people, but never a Christian. Uh, they can oppress, but they cannot possess. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives and the twice born child of God. John says in 1 John chapter 4, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Well, the Holy Spirit of God lives in me. I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. How in the world, how in the world can a person lose their salvation if God's doing the sealing? Can you answer me that question? How can a person be saved and be lost? The Bible says salvation is for eternity. It's eternal. For God so loved the world, just one verse, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's everlasting because God seals us under the day of redemption. So Paul goes on to say, some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And that's just exactly where we're at. Years ago, when we first uh, moved where we lived there in Dickensfield, uh, I was knocking doors on our street, and I met a teenage girl, led her to the Lord at the door, and uh, went back and spoke with her mother and her brother and, and tried to encourage him. And she said something to me that I had never heard about. And she said, what is Wicca? What is Wicca? Now, this is back in probably the early 90s. What is Wicca? Well, Wicca, of course, is witches. And this young girl was confused about Christianity and witches. So we're living in a day, beloved, when demonic forces are just moving so rapidly. Uh, you hear me saying from time to time, you should check your books in your home. You should go through your house. I go through my house frequently and I plead the blood through my whole home. Why? Because you can watch something on television. Somebody can visit in your home. And, and I know that demons can possess homes. You say, how do you know that? Because years ago, I was we were having a Bible study with some a family over here on um, well just a few blocks away. And uh, and and I could not study to save my soul. Every time we went to that home, only a few times, I could not, I could not teach. I just had no liberty at all. And then the man said to me, he said, you know, years ago we had our home blessed. He had a guru come and bless his home. What did he do? He brought demons in his home. And I had no liberty and it wasn't long ago. They said, don't come back anymore. And uh, so we're living in that time and that day when verse number 21 says, neither repent they of their murders. Well, of course, we think of the first murder, again, with, uh, with Cain uh, killing his brother. And then there's sorceries. Now, the word sorcery here is where we get the word pharmakia or pharmacy or pharmaceuticals. Today, you and I, well, not today, they may be closed today, but tomorrow, we could go and buy legal marijuana. Uh, you can you can get any kind of drug that you want. There's all kind of illicit drugs. There's all types of drugs. That, so I'm saying the Bible is just as fresh and more fresher than tomorrow's news. This was written 2,000 years ago. So we're living in a day when drugs are prevalent. Uh, notice the next thing, sex, fornication. Uh, a man no longer uh, wants to marry. They just... They have what they call common law, not in God's eyes. Uh, God's eyes, of course, is marriage. And marriage is, is uh, the Bible says, is marriage is honorable. 
and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers God will judge. So God is in marriage. God performed the first marriage act, and of course, there's a commitment there, and that commitment ought to be a lifetime commitment. So neither did they repent of their idols, verse 20, neither did they repent of their murder, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thieves. Who would have known one month ago, or however long it's been, that the riots across the border would be happening? Who would have ever thought that the justice system, law and order, would, would back up and allow man to ravish and rape and ruin their cities by mayors and governors who don't want Jesus, who do not want Jesus in their life, don't want Jesus in the school? Don't want Jesus in the courthouses. And so the world is chaotic. The world is a mess. But we must keep our hearts fixed upon the Lord. So we think about this. Look, look in the book of Jude. Just, just turn back from Revelation to the book of Jude. Look at Jude, verse 14 and verse 15. Oh, amazing. Love this little book of Jude. Verse 3 is a tremendous verse. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Beloved, we're no longer contending. We're no longer standing. We're no longer being faithful as we ought to be. We're the light. Can you imagine the havoc that's going to come to the world when the Christians are gone? By the way, all this tribulation stuff here about the time of the trip, we're not here. We're gone. But down here is going to be a horrible, horrible time. You are an influence, or you ought to be an influence. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. You influence somebody. You are an influence to someone. Maybe you don't even know this. But at work, if you're working like you ought to be working as a Christian, then people are taking stock of that. Your loved ones, if you are living for the Lord and, and trusting the Lord during these unbelievable times, unbelievable, unprecedented, there's never been days like this. I was around in 1967 when they rioted in, in Michigan where I'm from, and not like this. They brought off the National Guard. It was over in a few days. But this has just gone on and gone on, and it'll go on all summer because they're doing their part in the United States to keep this man from getting back in office who's for Christians, who's for the Jews, and is for morality. Now, he's not God's gift to man. I understand that he's just a man. But I cannot believe, nor can you believe, what's going on in the world. People are afraid to come out of their homes locked up in their homes. Now to be sure, there is a virus, yes, like the flu, and people get sick and people die. But people are so afraid, uh, just so afraid today. And uh, it's, of course, a lot of propaganda. Now, there's, it's real, I understand that, so don't judge me and want to send me hate mail. <laughs> or spit in my coffee or whatever you might do. In Enoch, the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, of these, saying, Behold, the Lord come with ten thousand of the saints to execute what? Judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. And I'm putting emphasis on that word ungodly, which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. For if God spared not the angels, verse 4 of 2 Peter 2, verse 4, that sinned, 
but cast them down to hell, Tara Tara, the pit, and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And, we just read, turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah unto ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example. If I read this in the average school today, they'd kick me out. If I went into the average meeting hall of, of, of politicians, they'd kick me out. I, they wouldn't let me read this. They'd throw me out the door. Overthrow them and notice them and making them an example. Now, God doesn't hate these people. God loves their souls, but not their sins. Those that, that after should live ungodly and deliver just Lot. Lot, what happened to you? Vaxed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, their conduct. For that righteous man dwelling among them, you can't fellowship with the world. The flesh and the devil, it'll eat you up. It will suck you in like a vortex. Remember, the world wants to entangle you. Your flesh wants to enslave you, and Satan wants to sift you. Remember what Jesus said to Peter. Behold, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to sift thee as wheat, but I have prayed for thee, and when thou art converted, strengthen the brother. We need some conversions. Not just people getting saved, but saved people getting convicted and, and coming to the place where they're willing to contend and stand up for the Lord. Where's God's people at? Where's God's people? They're hiding. Hiding when they should be standing. Where's God's preachers compromising when we should be preaching the truth and preaching it with authority and preaching it with power? The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust in the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly, verse 10, I'm reading 2 Timothy 2.10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness despise governments. Again, let's abolish the police. Crazy. How, how sick is that? Well, they're lost. And the politicians are demonic and controlled by demons. And by the way, who runs the world? Think I'm crazy? Who runs the world? The God of this world is the devil. So behind your favorite politician, uh, of course, is the devil. Unless he's saved, and if he's saved, uh, usually they'll compromise. You wonder when they get in office, what happens? Well, they find out maybe something in your closet. So we think about the politicians and realizing that we one day, in the millennium right, we will be the politicians, and there'll be justice. And, uh, and, and justice and liberty. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh, verse 10, I'm reading again, of uncleanness and despise governments, presumptuous are they self-will, <clears throat> they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, goodness gracious, whereas angels which are greater in power and might, bringing out railing accusations against them before the Lord. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of things that they understand not and shall un utterly perish in their own corruption and shall re receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Sports are they and blemishes, spots are they and blemishes, spotting themselves sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast unto you. Having eyes, here it is, full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. It's sad to realize the trafficking of human beings. Daughters being sold, stolen. That's why it's imperative when you travel to keep your eye on your kids. Sex traffic, slave trade. 
beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practice, cursed children. Folks, the Bible is real, the Bible is true, and I'm glad I'm not going through the tribulation. But if you have loved ones, and family members, and husbands or wives that are lost, oh my soul, you need to get along with the Lord and ask the Lord to place your loved one upon your heart. Can you imagine how horrific and how horrible it's going to be during the tribulation? Look at the lawlessness in the states. Just watch it. I don't watch the news anymore because I'm fed up with it. And you can't believe what you hear and the half of the stuff you see. Unbelievable. Unbelievable lawlessness. Anarchy that is happening around the world. So we need to take a stand. We need not to give up, throw in the towel, but we need to undergird ourselves to come into the place where we're converted to encourage the brethren. Shall we stand together? <clears throat> And Father, unbelievable, from 41 years ago, almost 42 years ago when I preached my first sermon, I can remember preaching Jude 3, earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Help us to be contenders. Help us, O oh God, to have convictions about righteousness and righteous living. And Lord, help us to be willing to pull up the loss and push up the saved, O oh God. So many people are downcast, discouraged, discouraged, depressed, living in despair, because they've taken their eyes off of Jesus. Paul said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured this cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, Lord Jesus. We pray even tonight, come Lord Jesus. Lord, it'd be wonderful to see you soon. The Lord, when you come and we're gone, this world is going to be turned totally upside down. So Lord, give us a compassion and give us a burden for the lost and the saved. Lord, so many of our church family, they're, they're not coming. They don't intend on coming. And Lord, many of them are no longer listening to the live feed because they have changed their schedules. And I've talked and spoken with people and I said, have you, have you listened to the message? And, no, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. And that's like a Thursday or a Wednesday that I'm talking to them. So Lord, help us. Help us few. And Lord, you said, and my wife has always reminded me, when you come, will you find any faith that is being faithful? God, help us to be faithful. And thank you for our little flock, the faithful, Lord, who come, who stand, and the Lord, who want to hear from heaven. So I pray tonight that we've heard from thee. And I pray that you've dealt with us. And Lord, as we waken in the morning, you tarry your coming. Help us to be mindful of those three enemies that entangle us, enslave us, and deceive us. And help us to be for Christ. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. God bless you.